Starting recording. <clears throat> All right, here we go. All righty. Okay, so I think uh, you wanted to talk about the 70 weeks. Yes, sir. Okay. That's Daniel 9. Right, and so I think uh, if I remember right, uh, yeah, he Daniel gives like a prayer, and then he sort of gets interrupted. Yeah, while he was, yeah, and then, uh, and so then he's uh, told to uh, consider the vision, right? And so, verses twenty four, twenty five, twenty six, twenty seven is the vision. Yes, sir. All right. So, um, what do you say we read? Uh, we read these four verses, and then we talk about it. Perfect. Okay. Um, Seventy weeks are <clears throat> determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression and to make an end of sins and to make reconciliate, reconciliation for an equity and to bring in everlasting righteousness, and to seal up the vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah, the Prince, shall be seven weeks and threescore and two weeks, the street shall be built again, and the wall even in troublous times. And after threescore and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end thereof shall be with a flood, and unto the end of the war desolations are determined. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week, and in the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice and the, the oblation to cease. And for the overspreading of abominations he shall make it desolate, even unto the consummation. And that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. Okay, your thoughts, Alex? Uh, my thoughts are it's uh, one of the most convicting prophecies of messiah within the scriptures because it gives an actual timeline to messiah it shows you in verse 24 that there's six things that are going to be fulfilled within that prophecy and then it gives you the details of the breakdown of some of the times that are going to be some of the uh, landmarks of the time of the prophecy within it, such as because you got the seven weeks, then you got the 60 and two weeks. It says the street will be built again and the wall, even in troublous times. And then it talks about how Messiah will be cut off and all the things that will happen there. So I personally don't see Antichrist in there at all. I don't know if you do. I know that's the uh, mainstream view of the prophecy. But, uh, yeah, so I think he gives us a direct time that shows us exactly when Messiah was going to show up, when Jesus was going to come and perform these six things and fulfill the prophecy. Uh, okay, yeah, so I, I, I'm not seeing Antichrist in there anywhere at all. Okay. Uh, so, and I, I, I know what you're saying because it's, I think people have lost their mind. To, I, don't, I don't know how they can read that and see Antichrist. You know, I've, I'm hearing people say that the Messiah is the Antichrist. And, Crazy. Yeah. And then, uh, and then also people, uh, one one of the things they say is that uh, this here, and he shall confirm the covenant with many. They think that he is 
pointing to the prince here, but the subject <clears throat> is the people, not the prince. So that's that's just wrong too. And exactly. It's obvious he is pointing to Messiah because that's the subject matter. Indeed. Yeah. Indeed. So, yeah, so if you would, uh let's talk about those six things. Okay. Okay, so I think the first one would be um to finish the transgression, is that right? Yep. All right, talk. Okay, so to finish the transgression, um, what do I have here? I got Isaiah 53, 8 and 12. We go there. Isaiah 53. Yeah, so this is Isaiah when it's talking about prophesying about Jesus. Did you so, say verse 8? Yeah, verse 8. Okay, he was taken from prison and from judgment, and who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living for the transgression of my people was he stricken. Mm -hmm. so, should I read that whole thing or just uh, you got some thoughts on that? Well, number eight. Yeah, I think it just shows it uh, reflects how it says Messiah will be cut off. Right. Yep. So it says and then it even elaborates on it that he'll be cut off out of the land of the living. Out of the land of the living. So that's showing that he's cut off from life. His, uh, well, his physical life anyways. So he does get, so that just shows the, uh, the sacrifice, the crucifixion of Jesus. And it just shows that it was done for the transgression of the people to finish the transgression. Yep. Yeah. And then there was, uh, I had 12 written down as well there. Oh, uh, okay. So therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he has poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bare the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. Okay. Yeah. So he interceded for us and made that atonement. <clears throat> to pay for our transgression transgression and to finish it. And yeah, another verse that I had about that was uh, John 1930. Okay. When there, I'm sorry, when Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head, bowed his head, and gave up the ghost. Correct. So, there he says, it is finished. So, that's where he's saying, the transgression is finished, the atonement is paid for, and that is where he basically seals up the prophecy and it's pretty much finished right there. It's basically what it's saying. Those are the verses I had for uh, to finish the transgression. There's probably more. What did you think? Yeah, no, I, I agree. Um, I'm not sure I can add anything more to that. And then the second one was to make an end of the sins. Or I'm yep. sorry, to make an end of sins. Because Jesus kind of made an end of sins, right? Through his blood, he washes away our sin. So I had a few verses there. I had uh, John one twenty nine. John one twenty nine. The next day, John sees Jesus coming 
unto him and saith, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Takes and, away the sin of the world. Yeah, so Jesus is the one who makes an end of sins by taking away the sins of the world. And then I had uh, 1 John, 1 John 3, 5. One John three five, and ye know that he was manifested to take away our sin, and in him is no sin. There you go. Can't say it much more clear than that. Yeah. So. He takes mm -hmm. away our sins. Mm-hmm. Which so, makes an end of sins. Yep. Yeah. Crystal clear. Very. Yeah. The word of God will always define itself. Very clear. Then I had First uh, Corinthians fifteen three as well. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. Yeah. Just another thing, just showing again that Christ died for our sins, and he makes an end of sins. Yep. Praise him. Yep. And um, maybe I can add one. And he is the appropriation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Amen. Past, present, and future. Yep. Everybody's got a chance. Everybody's got an opportunity. Amen, brother. And then I had also Hebrews 9.28 was the last one I had written down for that. Oops. So Christ was once offer to bear the sins of many unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation yeah so he was offered to bear the sins of many so that our sin is put on him and his sacrifice and his blood washes it away therefore making an end of sins yep Yep. Yeah, what is that one? And it says he shall appear the second time, right? I don't yeah. ever hear I don't ever hear it saying him ever appearing a third time. No. Oh. <laughs> Just the second time. He's Just the second back. coming. Yeah. That's right. I think we were talking about that the other day. Yes, sir. I'm not sure if this is related, but this just popped up in my head. Come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. So his blood is going to wash us, or his blood washes us clean. Yes, washes our sin away. Yep. Yep. And, awesome. Uh, if you don't mind, just one more. No, please. <laughs> Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute impute sin. So there's no there's no sin being imputed upon us that uh, that are saved. So, Agreed. That's good stuff, man. Yeah. So I think that pretty much uh, those first two are shown right there pretty clearly through the scriptures. Uh, number three, to make reconciliation for iniquity. Uh, the first one I had written down was back in Isaiah 53. That amazing, uh, it's 53.5, the prophecy of Jesus. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our inequities. 
The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. Yeah, so that's kind of saying it's making reconciliation for our wickedness, right? Yeah. He was he was bruised for our wickedness. Yeah, yeah, it's amazing. Yeah, really. Such the word is just so beautiful. It's amazing. Yeah. Just the living, powerful word of God that it will uh, convict your heart and it will show you truth. And that's really our one standard that we can trust for truth. It's the one thing that we can look to and hold as ultimate truth without any wavering doubt. Okay, so... So also to make reconciliation for iniquity, my next one I had was uh, Romans 5.10. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. There you go. Yeah, that's good stuff. Just so it's showing how he is the reconciliation of our wickedness to be able to connect us back with God through his blood that we may be his sons. Yes, sir. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Yeah. Amazing. Cool. And then... Um, what was the next one there? Uh, 2 Corinthians 5.18. And all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and has given to us the ministry of reconciliation. Reconciliation. Am I saying that right? That sounds funny when I say it. Recon, reconciliation. Reconciliation. That, yeah. sil that word silly is in there. Reconciliation. It's a little, it's a little silly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it's, but it's a whole lot true, right? Absolutely. It's very powerful. It's nothing like silly. <laughs> no. And all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and has given to us the ministry of reconciliation yeah so us being sons of god we kind of have the ministry of going out and preaching that anyone can be reconciled to god but it's only through jesus because he is the way the truth and the life and no man goes to the father but through jesus you got right? that right yeah Yeah. So this one, yeah, this one's definitely very clear that this had been completed by Jesus. There's also uh, Colossians 1, 20 and 21. Did I spell that right? And you that were sometimes alienated and enemies in your mind by the wicked works, by wicked works, yet now has he reconciled. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's... Yeah. Also number 20, 20 and 21. And 20, okay. Yeah. And having made peace through the blood of his cross by him to reconcile all things unto himself, by him I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven, and you that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now has he reconciled. That's, Amen. That's uh, overwhelming evidence, isn't it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, very clear. Very clear, those first three have definitely been fulfilled by Jesus, and the scriptures show that clearly. And then there's also uh, Ephesians 2. 
Ephesians 2, 14 through 16 was the last one I had. Um, sorry, say that again. Ephesians 2, 14 through 16. Okay. okay. And, uh, okay, uh, for he is our peace who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace, and that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the Christ, having slain the enmity thereby. Mm. There we go. So it's kind of like, before you're saved, we all have this division in us, this double-sided nature of good and evil, but he is able to break that down and have us shine through the light the light of Jesus into the world through us, through his spirit kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. What he, yeah. So we're like, it says, let your eye be whole. Right. Yeah. The light of the body is the eye. Yeah. Am I saying that right? Yeah, I think so. The window the of the body. Soul. Yeah, the window of the soul is the eye. That's mm -hmm. that's uh, similar, right? Mm -hmm. the, the light of the body is the eye. The light of the body is the eye. Yeah. Uh, therefore, when go. thine eye is single, thy whole body also is full of light. But when thine eye is evil, thy body also is full of darkness. Yep. And Jesus has been able to break down that wickedness in us so that we can be full of light shine yes, forth sir. not that we'll ever be perfect but we can uh we can try our best <laughs> well yeah i mean really it's our flesh that's holding us back isn't it indeed we can be perfect in spirit but yep. in the flesh it's it's a tough thing only jesus has the power to overcome the flesh or had the power yeah and uh and our hope is in that day when we shed this flesh and we are given a a new body, an incorruptible body. Amen. Yes. Okay. Okay. So what about this, what about this next one? To bring in everlasting righteousness. Did he do that? Absolutely. <laughs> I've got so many verses for this one. It's... All right, let's get them. Let's get them. Okay. Uh, Romans 3, 22, 21 and 22. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe. Or there is no difference. Yep. And then also in that same chapter 25 and 26. Oh, sorry, sorry. St still, in, still in Romans 3, but 20 yep. verses 25 and 26. Okay. And um, whom God has set forth to be appropriation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God, to declare, I say, at this time his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. Mm -hmm. That's great. So he justifies us through his righteousness. His righteousness is everlasting. Yeah, yeah. Just, just like the life that we receive when we believe and are born again. Yep. Yeah. We're, without him, we're not justified. With him, through him, we're justified. 
Absolutely. Without because him, yeah. No, go ahead. Yeah, without him, we're just lost sheep, and uh, we're going to be eaten by the wolves out there. There's yeah. a lot of them trying to wear sheep's clothing these days. So, oh, it's unbelievable. Yeah. Without, yeah. Without him, we're we're doomed. We wouldn't be seeing any of this truth if uh, we wouldn't see any truth if it wasn't for him. We'd just be lost. None at all. Yeah. We'd be blind to it. Absolutely. Okay, so number the next one would be uh, 2 Corinthians 5.21. For he has made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Love it. Amen. So we are made the righteousness of God in him, in the spirit, and that spirit is, has eternal life now. So that would be everlasting righteousness. Yes, sir. Boom. So uh, next one is Matthew three fifteen. Matthew 3, you said? Yeah, Matthew 3, verse 15. And Jesus answering said unto him, Suffer it to be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness that he suffered him. Yeah. So there you can fulfill all righteousness. Bringing in everlasting righteousness. Yes, sir. And I would say that that point where... Uh, He's getting uh, John the Baptist to baptize him. That is that is where he was anointed, I would say, in his baptism. Would you agree with that? Um, when John baptized Jesus? Yeah, that was kind of like the beginning of his ministry and the, the anointing of the Most Holy. Oh, um, okay. Is that possibly it? Then the heavens were opened up and the Spirit of God descending like a dove and that's lighting an, upon him. That's an anointing. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's, yeah. that's an anointing. Absolutely. All righty. So, Matthew 3.15. Then the next one was Romans 5, 17 through 21. Romans five seventeen through 21. Yes, sir. For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more they which received abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as by the offense of one judgment came upon all men to condemnation, we can go by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. That as sin has reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's good stuff. Yeah, that's powerful. Yeah. Love yeah. It. So Jesus Christ bringing in everlasting righteousness. Hallelujah. Yeah. No question. Yep. Very clear. So that was Romans. Oh man, I've got so many more. <laughs> Romans go. ten Romans ten four. Romans ten four. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. Yes. So what's he saying right there? He's saying uh, he 
he has basically it's saying he's he's the end of the law as in he's fulfilled the law he says he's not come to destroy but to fulfill and so he ends the law by fulfilling it and now he is to bring forth the righteousness towards men for men that we may live with the the liberty that he's given us that we can live as we are persuaded to through the holy spirit it's kind of what i'm seeing there yeah no you're right exactly exactly yeah, yeah. just another another verse that shows how uh, we're not really under the the uh, hebrew laws through like the dietary laws and all that sort of stuff and, yeah uh, yeah Okay, and then Second uh, Corinthians nine nine. Oh, wait! I didn't know I could do this. Oh, nice. Okay, so uh, nine nine. Okay, as it is written, he has dispersed abroad; he has given to the poor. His righteousness remains forever. Yeah. There we go. Everlasting righteousness right there. Yeah. Okay. And then uh, what do we have next? Yeah. First, first, go ahead. Oh, no, go ahead. Yeah. Next I was just... Yeah, go ahead. First Corinthians one thirty. See, I didn't know I could do it that easy like that before. That's easier than typing it all out okay uh 130 but of him are in christ jesus who of god has made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption yep that according as it is written he that glorieth let him glory in the lord (laughs) yes sir just another one that shows that ye are in Christ were made wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. So yes. just another thing showing the righteousness that Christ brought in for us. And then uh, Galatians 2.21. Galatians 2.21. Boy, that's so much easier than typing. All right. I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. That's something I think a lot of people could learn. Absolutely. Many people on those uh, Hebrew, mo- Hebrew roots movements uh, are missing the point there. Yeah, a lot of people. Or they just don't want to see it. They'd rather just read their extra biblical texts and shalom, shalom to each other and whatnot. Yeah, yeah you know, but really, man, the whole world could benefit from learning that. Uh, first, lo- learning the law of Moses and then learning uh, the grace of God, you know. Yeah. Through Jesus Christ. And. But, you know, that stuff is not taught in schools. Those kids spend 13-plus years in a public school system, and they don't learn one line of the law. And it's by the law that the law will, will push people, if you will, to Jesus Christ. Absolutely. It'll make it clear and make it known that everybody needs a savior. But of course, that's not in the public schools, and that's why the world is going to hell in a handbasket. For sure. Yep, because they spend those 13 years or whatever basically trying to turn you away from God. They'll teach you everything the opposite of what God's word teaches you, right? Yeah. Everything in the creation, like, oh, the. What does it say? 
just like just basically everything in creation like oh we're we're spinning they say we're spinning around when really god says no the earth there shall be stable that it shall not be moved and then says oh yeah the sun was created and then there was light they say nope. but it's like no the light was there first the sun came after yeah in the word of god how do you explain that professor yeah the only thing he can say well the bible's wrong that's the only position he can take yep all right what did we just do there galatians 2 so next i got three more first one of those will be uh second timothy 4 8 Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. Mm. Yeah. Yes, sir. We are going to love that appearing. It's going to be great. I'm sure we're going to go through, uh, God's going to make us really understand and feel all the sins that we did commit in our lives and probably show us how not good we really were but in the end we shall have everlasting life and yeah yeah, yeah, yeah I, glory think, to I think about that quite a bit and i you know i just don't know when when he's gonna come but I know he's coming. Yeah, absolutely he's coming. Okay, and then we had uh, 1 Peter 2.24. First Peter 2? Yep. Yeah. Verse 24. 24. Who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree that we, being dead to sins, should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes ye were healed. Mm -hmm. So we are healed by him, and he is bringing ever, bring in everlasting righteousness unto us. So he will bring in a righteous spirit into us through his stripes, being perfect, being that perfect sacrifice for sins which fulfills God's law. And yeah, God makes the law because he's the creator. So he decide, I guess, in the spiritual realm that the way Jesus comes through, he pays for our sins. And that's what earns us justice and the right to everlasting life. Yeah. The way he's made that. Hard to understand, sort of, but it makes no, sense. Not really. I mean, not really, yeah. <laughs> he did it all for us, right? And, yes, sir. Uh, it would be really hard to understand if you thought you had to, you know, put some of the work in yourself, but uh, he's done it all. Yeah. The only thing that we might lack is faith. Exactly. We have to humble ourselves to him. And then he will work through us. Yeah. The more, the more proud of a spirit we have, the, the less good we can do, I think. That's possibly why uh, even Paul had that thorn in the flesh or whatever that he spoke of. To kind of keep him humble so that he didn't get too, uh, too proud. Yeah. Yep. Because he, he definitely did... <laughs> He wrote like ha almost half of the uh, New Testament, right? So yeah, that could yeah. definitely that could go to someone's head, right? If he was if he was perfect, but he had that thorn in the flesh, so that he could remain humble is kind of how I've saw, how I've seen that. Yeah, well, it's yeah, it's good. It's <laughs> good for anybody and everybody to have that uh, thorn, right, and to stay mm -hmm. humble. Absolutely. God just wants us to give him the glory, you know, yeah. all the glory is his anyways. He wants us just to admit that we've been bad, turn to him with all our, all our body, mind, spirit, strength, and 
mind and just turn to him and <clears throat> trust him and follow his word, thirst for his word. And then go out and share that with people and speak truth in real life. Yes, sir. Be a man and get out there. We don't necessarily have to uh, be heroes, but just go out there and speak truth. Don't don't be afraid. Like I don't know. One little thing that I that I'll do because I work with uh, a lot of uh, heathens, we'll say. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, you'll just hear them. They'll swear like, and Jesus Christ is one of the biggest swear words. Yeah. So someone will someone will be like, oh Jesus Christ, and then I'll just turn <laughs> them up, and I'll just be like, eh. And then, but I'll but I'll turn it back on them and just be like, yep, Lord and Savior. Yep. And then they're just like, huh? I'm like, yeah, that's right, Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And like, oh, oh yeah, whatever, man. <laughs> and it's like, yeah, yeah, he's Lord and Savior. Yep. You you yeah. be bringing that up. I'm gonna bring it right back to you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, you're building consciousness, right, with these guys. So now they're gonna think about it. They're gonna think about your reaction and what that word actually means. So that's yeah, yeah. And people really need that because everybody is surrounded by heathens. And it's rare when a true Christian comes along and speaks boldly the word of God and, you know, professes his uh, faith in Jesus Christ. It's rare. So anytime you get that opportunity, think about this. This might be the only time that person hears the gospel. And, it, you know, I think people take that for granted, really. Yeah. Uh, so that's good on you, man. That's good on you. Yeah. And like we all have these battles. We get in these positions where it's it's uncomfortable to speak about, but we're called to do the things that are uncomfortable. You know what I mean? Yeah. If we're not offending someone, we're not doing our job as a right. Christian properly. Right. Exactly. So that's to say. Which one did we just do there? Was that verse Peter two twenty four that we just did? Uh, I was. I do believe twenty four. You said, yeah, yeah. Uh, no, first, first Peter two, verse twenty four. Yeah, no, it was twenty four. Yeah, okay. And then the last one that I had was Second uh, Peter one, one through four. Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, grace and peace be multiplied unto you. You said one through four? Yeah. Okay. Sorry about that. And multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, according as his divine power has given us unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that has called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Mm. Yep. Yeah. The righteousness of God and our Savior, which is everlasting. And that will be, that will bring uh, all good things to us. Yes. Mm -hmm. That we might be partakers of the divine nature, so that's speaking through our spirit, so that we may escape this corruption. By having everlasting righteousness brought into us. Yes, sir. Okay, what's, so, what's this last one, last thing mean, in your opinion? Having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Can you explain that a little bit? <clears throat> well, I think it's kind of showing that uh, our spirit has escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. So. Our spirit will now thirst for righteousness. It will, uh, our spirit, now that we're reborn, it's going to, uh, it's going to love righteousness and it's going to eschew evil. So it's going to, 
It's going to love the good and it's going to want to push the evil away from us in our spirit. So that even if we do sin in our, through our flesh, our spirit will be grieved and the Lord will also punish us or whatever his uh, admonition or. Uh, yeah, because now then we're now his sons and he will. Uh, uh, what was that word? We forgot it last time. <laughs> that Is it time. chastise? Yeah, chastisement of the Lord. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, so he'll chastise us when uh, when we sin now, just as any good father would chastise his son when he does wrong so that he can learn, has that physical and that that feeling of it so that they know the next time that they're they're not going to do that again. They're going to know, OK, if I do this, like things are not going to go well for me. I better focus here and stay the path. Don't turn to the right hand or the left. Straight ahead with the Lord. That's the way to go. What would you what would you have to say about that? Yeah, no, I think you 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 said it perfectly. I really do. Uh, uh, absolutely. Because um, it, I mean, if you truly are saved, uh, you don't want to you don't want to do wrong. You don't want to you know, you don't want to believe something that's false. You don't want to do something that's you know, a sin against God. You you want to be perfect, right? And so this is, um, uh, so when we believe in Jesus Christ, we're saved, we're born again of the Spirit, and we have God dwelling in us. Uh, that is our escape from, uh, you know, the the sins or, or the lust of the flesh, right? Yeah. And, so I was having a conversation uh, last night, I, I, if I remember right, uh, about somebody. Uh, they were saying that God couldn't come into, God couldn't be a man, right? And so, and so I try to explain it in a way that, uh, you know, yes, our flesh is not perfect, that the, the our body is built to die, but God came into our flesh to show us that there is a way to escape out of this flesh, if that makes any sense. Yeah. So, yeah, anyways. Did, and did you quote to them First uh, Timothy 3.16? And without controversy, great is the mystery oh, of godliness. Yeah. About God times. was manifest in the flesh. Justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. Yeah, so. I prob probably quoted that maybe ten times, but I I don't like <laughs> I don't like to do that. But you know, but maybe the first nine times he missed it. God was manifest <laughs> in the flesh, and but the you know the thing is, great is the mystery of godliness, right? You know, without exactly. controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. 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 So you're trying to understand how can God be, or how can I'm sorry, how can Jesus be God, and then Jesus also be uh, the mediator? You know how yeah. can you know if Jesus is God, then how did he die? If God can't die. Well, uh, it's a great mystery for sure. Uh, well, his flesh died, and then yeah. yeah, and then they'll they'll bring up things like, oh well, I I don't get it. Like how how does how does Jesus how does he pray if he's God? What is he praying to himself? Yeah. And it's like, well, no. Well, sort of. <laughs> it's, yeah. There's the Godhead, right? Which is mentioned three times in scriptures. And that's the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. Jesus being the Word. The Father being God Almighty. Yeah, Jesus being the Son, the Word. And then the Holy Ghost, the Spirit of God. So there is those there's those intricacies that are that are the great mystery of God that we will never fully understand until the Lord shows it to us, right? Right. Exactly. I mean, if you're trying to think that you can have it all figured out, you better rethink that. Yeah. 
You just got to take what's in the words, know that they're true. And then through prayer and fasting and study, then the Lord might show it through to you. Might, he might reveal these things to you. Yeah. If he chooses to. So yeah. It's all for his pleasure. Yeah, but now, so you got to have faith, right? In, in order to understand, if you don't have faith, there's no way you're going to understand it. Very true. Awesome. Yeah. So it, it, when you boil it all down, it's all about faith. Agreed. Agreed. And, and it's always been about faith. Yeah. And the okay. more you get, yeah. So next no. one, I guess. Yeah, we, and the more you what? Uh, the more you get into the word and the more you study it, the more your faith is increased because you see just how perfect it all is and how it all lines up, how it's all prophesied. It's all perfectly detailed. Everything you read here a little and there a little and they all interconnect perfectly like a DNA molecule. <laughs> all the A, T, C's and G's all connecting perfectly to make the instructions of you. These are the instructions for us in this life, how to live. And that's God in, in his language, trying to show him the mystery of him by giving us this whole history, that this true history of the world through the genealogies and everything and all the uh, little shadows and archetypes that are shown, such as the, uh, the sacrifice in the Old Testament, how there has to be shedding of blood for remission of sins. And all these things are leading up to Jesus being the perfect sacrifice for our sins that we may live with everlasting life. We may be redeemed through his blood. Yes, sir. Yes. The more you get into it, the more your faith is increased because it's just the Lord will reveal to you. The more, the more you uh, search for him, the more he's going to be there for you. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, uh, you know, absolutely agree. The, the key is faith. And, uh, you know, I, I always encourage people to, you know, just like you said, read the Bible. Uh, don't, you know, if you're, I'm not, I'm not against watching YouTube videos and uh, listening to people like me and you talk. I'm not, I'm not against that at all. But you should also have your fair share of reading the Bible. It takes, what, five minutes to read a chapter? If you read just one chapter a day, you would, you know, you would grow immensely and your faith would grow as well. So I just, uh, you know, I always like to try to encourage people to just read, you know, take five minutes out of your day and just read. Everybody's so busy all the time. Just read a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, I've I've heard things in videos before that uh, like there'd be inmates or whatever who've gone into prison and they have had they've had like a grade two level of reading, and then someone in there will get them on the King James Bible, and then they'll read that for six months or a year, and they'll come out and they'll have like a a university level reading yeah. just from reading the Word of God. Yeah. And uh, have you ever heard of uh, Gail Ripplinger? I have. Yeah. Yeah good sister of the Lord, just how she does the uh, showing how the King James Bible is its own dictionary. Have you seen that? Yeah, I have actually. Yeah. Yeah. It's pretty cool. Just how like every time a new word pops in the Bible, it's also explained and defined at the same time. Pretty much. Yeah. And she gives examples and that's yeah. been helpful that was helpful for me to understand and realize that whenever you see a word, there's going to be uh, other words that are going to explain what that word is talking about. So, yeah. So that helped. That really helped me uh, because, um, you know, I'm dumb and I come across words that, you know, I, I'm not even sure what they mean. But then when you read, uh, you know, the, the, the words before and after it gives an explanation. There's rarely a time when you come across the word that will not be supported by other words. Absolutely agreed. And yeah, it just gives you faith that you don't need to go 
shows you don't need to go outside of the scriptures to understand what's in the scriptures. Right, right. It's all there. It's all in the word of God. He's made it perfect and preserved divinely for us. Yeah, yeah. That was when I was having this conversation uh, before earlier. I think this was last night. I can't remember so well, but another guy was talking about uh, uh, something about the woman. Uh, uh, no, this guy was talking about. Uh, well, I don't want to explain the whole conversation, but the guy, he he, uh, this other guy, he he gives the the Greek definition for the word woman. And, yes. and and all I could say is I think everybody here knows what a woman is. <laughs> yeah. No doubt. You don't have to you shouldn't have to look up de definitions for woman. And so just like you to your point it, everything's right there in the Bible. You don't really need to go outside the Bible for anything. I mean it applies for for your life and for the world uh, around you, but uh, to learn the actual words, you don't need to go. Uh, you you really don't need to go to a dictionary, even yeah. though even though you can, because uh, I do that sometimes. I'll go to the what the 1857 dictionary. Nice, and but you certainly, I don't understand these people that go to a Greek dictionary doesn't make any sense to me anyways yeah or lots of people like to go on the uh, the concordances as well which they can they can help bring a little more depth to your understanding but at the same time the translators were very skilled at what they did and they took into account all the uh, turn of phrases and just the way the people use the words and the way the connotations of the words would have been used so that sometimes when you take the straight uh, translation of a word in a concordance or something, you're not actually getting the, the true meaning out of it. I just, does that sort of make sense? Oh, uh, I'm not sure that what you're talking about exactly. Okay, so the way the Hebrews would say uh, one word means something or other or the way they'd say something it would uh would mean something else just like the way the words the way the people used the words back in those days so that they translated it so that the proper meaning and then when you look in the concordance it can almost make it seem like it means something different i i got you yeah i got yeah. you so yeah. like Within each language, there's a certain style, a certain way that people talk, and so, uh, so you can't you can't depend on a, I guess, a sort of a straight word for word transliteration or whatever you want to call it. Exactly, exactly. The word for word translation won't have the full meaning because it doesn't have all those. Uh, different ways the words were used because words can mean so many different things, right? Yeah. yeah. One word can mean 10 different things. Like like a, uh, a concordance doesn't take into account the context the word's being used for, the common phrases that were used by the people, the kind of like the cultural references, figures of speech, the metaphors, stuff like that. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, and so in my experience, the only reason people go to the Greek and Hebrew is so that, I mean, not the only reason, let me rephrase that. The main reason people go to the Greek and Hebrew is so that they can change the Word of God to mean what they want to say. Exactly. The only exactly. The main reason. I shouldn't, I can't, I got to make sure I don't say the only reason because it's not the only reason, It's the, but it is the main reason. Uh, for sure. Yeah, speaking in absolutes is uh, not usually a good practice. No, it's <laughs> not. And I probably do that too much, but uh, absolutely. <laughs> we all do. Yeah. Okay, so I believe we're on number five now. Number to five, seal, okay. Let's see. Seal up the vision and the prophecy. There it is right there. Yes, sir. 
What do you think about yeah. that one? I think he sealed it up perfectly. I think uh, it's, yeah, I think, uh, yeah, Jesus completely fulfilled this prophecy exactly on time as he was supposed to. So the first one I have there is uh, Luke 24, verses 25 through 27. Twenty-five through twenty-seven. Then he said unto them, O fools, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken, ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? Question mark. And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Yes. So Jesus was able to show uh, to his disciples there that all of the things of himself in the Old Testament, all of the things back there, and that how he came and that he did fulfill them all. It's kind yeah. of why I put that verse in there. Yeah, that, no, that's good stuff because uh, yeah. we've already... Uh, or we're covering it now, I guess, in Daniel, right? I mean, it's all over in the Old Testament. Yeah. Yeah, that's good stuff. Yeah, there's no, there's no seven-year period broken off from the 490 years with a 2,000-year gap. There's just tribulations. <laughs> just, just tack that on at the end of time. We'll just kick that down the road 2,000 years without any anything in the word of god to say that or suggest That's it whatsoever funny. yeah it's just out there floating yeah. nothing. just ignore that no, yeah because yep. yeah, the the timeline was given so that people could look and see and be like yes there is our savior maybe uh like who was it uh there was the old guy who was in the temple i think he was uh simeon maybe i think it's in luke or something but anyways, uh, Simeon, how he was actually waiting for the Messiah, because I think it was revealed to him that he wouldn't die until he saw the, uh, till he saw the Messiah. Yep. He took up, I think, yeah, he took up Jesus, took up Jesus and blessed him. And Mary was all like, oh, wow, this is uh, pretty crazy. Yeah, so he was waiting for the consolation of Israel. There it is. Yep. Yeah. 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 So that was good. So maybe, I'm sorry, the point I was trying to make there is maybe Simeon also knew this and had this faith because of this very prophecy. And he paid attention to the... Uh, that would be uh, going a little farther than what the scriptures explicitly state, but it's no. possible that uh, it, yeah, he was able to know from that timeline given by God. That's a good point. That really is a good point. Because hmm. uh, he, he had, you know, obviously it would take great faith to, to, know, like, to know something like that and to, um, to be patient, right? Yeah to be waiting at the temple at that exact time when he was brought there to, for the reconciliation or for the, uh, whatever the dove sacrifice for Jesus when he was born. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah that, that would have been an incredible experience. Absolutely. Yeah. Yep. And then Mary just had to, Mary kept all those things in her heart. And remembered them. Okay, so to seal up the vision and the prophecy, uh, the next one I had was Revelation nineteen ten. Revelation nineteen ten. Okay. And I fell at his feet to worship him. I'm sorry. And I fell at his feet to worship him, and he said unto me, See thou not, I'm sorry, see thou do it not, 
I am thy fellow servant and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus, worship of God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Mm -hmm. So, stealing up the vision and the prophecy, the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. So, yes, sir. So he has, he has sealed it, finished it. And that also goes back to John 19.30, where Jesus said, it is finished. Before he gave up the Holy Ghost. Oh, yeah, right. Yep. It is finished. It is sealed up. And then uh, I had one more verse for seal up the vision and prophecy. That was uh, John one twenty nine. The next day, John seeth Jesus coming in unto him, and saith, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Mm -hmm. Maybe that one was supposed to be under to make an end of sins. <laughs> but, well, I think, but, uh, yeah. But it also, what? the Lamb of God. You'll have the vision of the prophecy. Did we read that one earlier when we were talking about that? Oh, yeah, we did. Yeah, sorry. I guess I just threw that one down in here as well. Yeah, it's still a good verse. Still, yeah. It takes away the sin of the world. The Lamb of God prophesied. Plain from the foundation of the world. That was my, uh, that was the one I had the least on, but, uh, do you have anything else? I think it's pretty obvious that Jesus sealed up the vision and the prophecy. Yeah, I mean, yeah. It's complete. Absolutely. It is finished. I mean, there's just no question in my mind. <clears throat> yeah. Okay, so I think we're on to the last one then. To anoint the most holy. All right, what do you think about this one? I think uh, the most holy was Jesus, and... As we were talking before, I think he was anointed when he was baptized by John and the Holy Spirit descended down in the form of a dove and lighted up in the form of a dove and lighted upon him. That was kind of that was his anointing as they do with uh, they do with oil in the Old Testament. And then Jesus was anointed with the Holy Spirit itself. So in the Old Testament, the. Uh, the oil being poured upon the kings or whoever was being anointed was a symbol of this Holy Spiritual anointing that Jesus received and that, yeah, and that Jesus received in that point. So we're going to go back into the Old Testament for uh, the first verse. That's Isaiah 61.1. Anoint the most holy. Isaiah 61. One. Yeah, isn't that interesting? Um, oh, I just screwed up, didn't I? Hold on a second. I double clicked it. All good. Just give me, there it is, okay. So isn't this interesting? 66 chapters yeah in 66 books in the bible and isaiah almost reads like the bible the whole entire bible so yeah. anyway six, verse one the spirit of the lord god is upon me because the lord has anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek he has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted to, procl uh, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to them that are bound. Mm -hmm. So the Lord hath anointed me. And that's, that's a prophecy of Jesus. If you can't see that, then <laughs> you, need to have a couple, you need to have a couple lessons. You need to do a little bit of reading before you come and watch this video, I guess. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. So the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. 
therefore Jesus was anointed before he was preaching these good tidings unto the meek or he was anointed to be able to do it. Yep. Yeah. So yeah. Jesus anointed. And then I had uh, Luke 418. Luke 4, verse 18. Okay. All right. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has appointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach the deliver. I'm sorry, to preach deliverance to the captives and recovering of the sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. Mm -hmm. but it sounded like I just read that verse, didn't it? Yeah, it's the exact mirror from the Old Testament to the New there, basically. Just, yes, sir. Yeah, just showing you again that it's Jesus and he's been anointed. Just fully completing Daniel 70 week prophecy there's no like what do they even say is not complete out of those six things that it that the prophecy says will be completed well, what, are, what are these guys trying to claim I don't know. well uh, there's I got two thoughts on that one uh, they don't pay a whole lot of attention to verse 24 and two um, they these guys almost well, how do I say this? Uh, what sells is uh, this idea of a coming Antichrist. Okay, that sells a lot of books, and that gets a lot of attention, and people really draw to that. Uh, but uh, they're all in for a big surprise because the Antichrist is already here. And this is not even talking about the Antichrist. And it's no. very shameful, really. Uh, because if you're looking at the Messiah as the Antichrist, uh, you're on the wrong side of the fence. Yeah. When it says, and he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. It's the covenant. It's not a covenant. It's in 27 there. All right. Yeah. Shall confirm the covenant. And obviously... It's the new covenant of yep. Jesus Christ, right? Yeah. yeah, it's not like the Antichrist is going to come along and make, make what's he going to say? Oh, I promise you this and that. I mean, it does not make any sense to me at all. Uh, yeah. But I'm, I'm hearing a lot of people, I've heard a lot of people for a long time preach that stuff. And uh, all it does is, but when I was a new when I was a new believer and I heard that, I was so confused by it. I didn't, uh, I didn't even care what Daniel had to say. Uh, you know, I, well, to be fair, I focused all my attention reading the New Testament when I was first saved. So uh, it wasn't that big of a deal. But obviously, mm -hmm. when you go and read it and look at it for yourself, if you were not to hear mm -hmm. that, outside noise you would not at all think that the antichrist was in this at all yeah now yeah. Daniel, daniel does talk about the four beasts and the fourth beast being what we refer to as the antichrist but yes the little horn right but it's not here in these uh passages that we're reading no purely a messianic prophecy yeah which you can actually date through the bible as well but let's uh let's finish the sixth one here quick sorry okay so it'd be uh n the next one i had was a mark 1 23 and 24 mark 1 23 24 yes sir 
And there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, saying, Let us alone. What have we to do with thee, thou Jesus of Nazareth? Art thou come to destroy us? I know thee who art thou. I'm sorry. I know thee who thou art, the Holy One of God. So, uh, whoever this guy was, uh, he knew that he was the Holy One of God, right? Yeah. Even even the unclean spirits know that he's the Holy One of God. Yeah. The most holy. Okay. And then we got uh, Mark 14.8. She has done what she could. She has come aforehand to anoint my body to the bearing. Yeah, I did this a while ago. I, <laughs> that one's not the best for anointing the most holy, but... Well, he... He was he, anointed. Yeah, he was anointed here with uh, yeah. some very expensive oils. Is this the one? Is this the same one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. That's the one. Yeah, the spike yeah. nard or whatever. Yeah, yeah, and they were they were like, hey, we could be selling this to giving it to the poor, right? Yeah. Yeah. And Jesus is like, uh, no, let it go, right? Yeah, for you have the poor with you always, and whensoever you will, you may do them good. But me, you have not always. Uh, she has done what she could. She has come beforehand to anoint my body to the bearing. Yes, no, I agree with that. That's an anointing also, right? Yeah. It's, it's, you arguably it's not the same kind of anointing that you were talking about back in when uh, John baptized Jesus. But uh, this is anointing for his burial. That is, yeah, that's the physical anointing of the most holy. Yeah. Whereas the other anointing would be the spiritual. Yeah, yeah, good point. <clears throat> okay, then uh, next one I had was Acts 4.27. Acts 4.27. For of a truth against thy holy child Jesus, whom thou hast anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate with the Gentiles and the people of Israel were gathered together. For to do whatsoever thy hand and thy counsel determined before to be done. Yes, sir. So it just shows, just shows again that talking uh so yeah paul's just talking about how jesus is he talking to god there yeah yeah so so he's just saying how jesus hath or how god hath anointed jesus right right yeah Yes, sir. Beauty, beauty. And then uh, Acts ten thirty eight. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. Doesn't get any clearer than that. No, it doesn't. Yeah. There we go. And then there's uh, Hebrews 1 9. Hebrews 1 9. Where is Hebrews? There it is. Oh. Hebrews 1 9. 
Thou hast loved righteousness and hated inequity. Therefore God, even thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. Yep. And that, in context, is speaking of Jesus. Oh, yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Unto the sun. Yeah. Perfect. And then, what did I have? I think I got one more. Acts 1731. Thirty-one? Seventeen Acts seventeen verse thirty-one. Thirty-one. Yeah. Okay, because he has appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he has ordained, whereof he has given assurance unto all men, in that he has raised him from the dead. Yes. Yes. Because ordained is basically a synonym for anointed. Right? Yep. That's right. Okay. Yes, sir. So I feel like we've clearly shown through the scriptures there that all six of the tenets of this Daniel 70 week prophecy have been fulfilled in Jesus. Yeah. Then we could maybe quickly just break down the uh, the rest of the things that they kind of try and say about that prophecy. Okay. So <clears throat> basically, yeah, so we just did twenty four, showing through the scriptures how that's all fulfilled through Jesus. So then in twenty five, it's telling you, know, know, and know therefore and understand. That from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah. So that point is in the Bible. I believe it's in uh, Nehemiah. It didn't have this one written down. But if we, uh, I believe the king was Artaxerxes. Yeah, that's pretty, that's really good. Uh -uh. Now, Nehemiah, or am I blind? Uh, up right three. There. there you go. I didn't think it was before. It tells you right there I don't know the Bible very well. Oh, I'm sorry. What is going on here? What, ne uh, what is it, Nehemiah 1 or Nehemiah? I think it's Nehemiah 2. Two one. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Is this a, okay? And it came to pass in the month Nisan, in the twentieth year of our tax service, was I close? The king, that wine was before him, and I took up the wine and gave it unto the king. Now, I had not been before sad this, in his presence. So I think we're looking, for, are we looking for a time? Or yeah, we... this is Nehemiah. He's sad. So I think, uh, so in verse five, he said unto the king, if it please the king, if there the servant is. found favor in thy sight, that thou wouldst send me yeah. into Judah in the city of my fathers, that I may build it. Yeah. And then, and a letter. Yeah, so he says, let him do letters. Yeah, so I guess it was basically at that time that he made the degree, was it? Yeah. To uh, you refresh my memory, this is, is this talking about 70 weeks or is this, is that Jeremiah? Oh, Jeremiah, where it was the, the 70 years? Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. I'm getting confused and tired, I think. But yeah. Yeah, it's pretty late for you. Yeah, no. Uh, yeah, I was thinking there was a... I don't know why. I was thinking there was some sort of time in 
Nehemiah. So explain this for me. So basically, uh, that's the time where the, where uh, Artaxerxes oh no yes wrote so the letters. That's what we're looking at, right? Yeah, we're looking at that king for a timeline. Yeah, so that so this was in the time the month Nisan, the twentieth year of Artaxerxes. So that's kind of when the timeline starts for the. For the 470 or the uh what you call it the 490 year prophecy so then yeah so then he went ahead and sent the made so he made the so he made the decree and then i believe was it cyrus i do yeah. believe. i'm afraid in cyrus serious. in ev- yeah, i think in ev- Oh no, sorry, it's in and then we got an Ezra seven. Uh Ezra. Yeah, Ezra seven. Thirteen. Right right before Nehemiah. Okay. Oh I'm sorry. So Ezra seven. Yeah, Ezra seven eleven, copy of the letter. Now this is the copy of the letter that the king Axarzeres gave unto Ezra the priest, scribe, even a scribe of the words of the commandments of the Lord, and of his statutes to Israel. Yeah, and then in thirteen, and I make I make a decree that all they. Of the people of Israel and of his priests and Levites in my realm, which are minded of their own free will to go up to Jerusalem, go with thee. For as much as thou art sent of the king and of his seven counselors to inquire concerning Judah and Jerusalem, according to the law of thy God, which is in thine hand, and to carry the silver and gold, which the king and his counselors have freely offered unto the God of Israel, whose habitation is in Jerusalem. So. Basically, from the point that Artaxerxes made the decree, that's kind of where it starts the timeline countdown, which, if you look into it, I believe adds up to 483 years from that point until the point where Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist. Okay. Yeah, no, I... I can't I can't teach that. I can't I can't prove it, but I've heard I've heard that before. Yeah. yeah. That's that's sort of the uh the idea. So if we go back to go back to uh Daniel twenty four, we can kind of just wrap this up, I guess, with uh whatever's left. So that was kind of the decree, the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem. So then it says, uh, shall be seven weeks and three score and two weeks. So it's breaking it up into different periods, breaking up into periods of time. The street shall be built again and the wall even in troublous times. So it says, so yeah, so at the end of verse 25, it says the street shall be built again and the wall even in troublous times. So it's breaking it down that there's seven weeks and there's 62 weeks. And it's saying, yep, the street shall be built again and the wall in troublous times. And if you look in the scriptures, you know that it was done in troublous times because the people that were doing the work had a weapon in one hand and their trowel or a brick in the other hand or whatever. Yep. You remember that? Yeah. Yeah. So... So then it says the street shall be built again and the wall even in troublous times. And then right after that, in verse 26, it says, and after three score and two weeks, saying that the 62 weeks that comes right after the wall and the street are rebuilt. Right. So that shows that that's a seven week period. So 49 years, basically, to build the street and the wall. And I guess the temple. 
or the temple took 46 years anyways. So then it says after these three score and two weeks, which is after the seven weeks. So that's 69 weeks, which equals 483 years. So it says, and after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off. So if it's after the 62 weeks, that is after seven weeks. So if it's after 483 years, that means that it must be in the last week. Gotta be. Right? It yeah. must be in that last group of sevens. If it's after, yeah. So if it's after 483 years, it has to be within the 490th week. Correct? Simple, simple, clear word of God. After, you don't even have to look outside of his prophecy to prove that it's about Messiah. And that all the 490 years happen consecutively in the time set forth by God. There's no magical tribulation week at the end of the year or at the end of time. Right? No. Right. It's direct, yeah. So it's directly after, directly after uh, 69 weeks shall Messiah be cut off. But not for himself, because he wasn't cut off for himself, but for us and our sins and our iniquity. Exactly. And then, um, I don't know what you think about this next part, but and then it says, And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end thereof shall be with a flood, and to the end of the war desolations are determined. The way... How have you understood that, or would you like me to explain what I think? Yeah, first? if you could, yeah. Yeah. So, I I look towards um, I don't know if you've heard of him before, but uh, Tom Fress. No. You heard of Tom Fress? Okay, he he breaks this down fairly well, like really well, and it's kind of like his mission in life to show people that Daniel's seventieth week prophecy is fulfilled and everybody's interpreting it wrong and taking the antichrist taking the false antichrist interpretation of it and being deceived and led astray and looking for things like the rebuilding of the temple and such and looking for this future antichrist when really the antichrist been here all along and even says in the new testament that his spirit has been here the spirit even works in the children of disobedience right now but yeah so I think that it's <clears throat> it's saying that the people of the prince, uh, he postulates that that is the people of Titus, the prince that came in 70 AD. They shall come and destroy the city and the sanctuary because allegedly in history, Titus came with his people, which you could even call a flood of people because it was so many people and thereof shall be with a flood. And the people came and they destroyed the city and the sanctuary and the end thereof shall be with a flood. Then they burned the temple and all the, and I, he said, I think that there were some historical records that even they were turning up the bricks in the temple because they burnt the temple and then the gold melted and ran down in between the cracks of the bricks. That's not in the scriptures, but yeah. it's an interesting thing to think that maybe just as Jesus said, there won't be one stone left unturned or whatever. So the gold melted in and they went through and turned up all the bricks where the gold melted in between them and to get the gold out of there. Okay. And the end thereof shall be with a flood. And could it, could it be that that flood is a flood of people that came forth? And then unto the end of the war, desolations are determined. So... The city was determined to be desol made desolate. That's yeah, kind of what I'm, that's kind of what I'm taking out of that. I don't know okay. what do you think. Well, uh, the, okay, so I don't want to. I don't want to come off as being uh, what's the word? Uh, you know, bullish about this, but. This 70 AD thing, it's not in the Bible anywhere, right? So I'm not, I don't teach it, and I don't, I just, I just can't, I can't teach it. I can't say this was fulfilled in 70 AD, because I can't prove it. 
I know. I, I mean, I have to go outside of the Bible to prove it. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. I'm not completely comfortable going outside of the Bible to prove things, but I don't know. I so, thought that. So, uh, yeah. Go so ahead. for that reason, I don't make. Uh, yeah, I don't. I just don't. Don't make that claim. No, I don't make that claim at all. And uh, and and so what I'm seeing is a lot of people are saying. Well, uh, 70 AD fulfilled a lot of things, not just what we're talking about right here, right? It's, yeah. it's, and so it sort of becomes a problem when people start doing that. So if you accept one, if they, you know, if they let, you, if they, uh, if they can get their foot in the door, then they'll try to bust open the door. And I'm not, and I'm not going there because none of that is backed by scripture. None of that, you know, the 70 AD thing. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, yeah. so that, that's my only thing. That's my only thing is you have to go to man's history to support that. And I just don't, I don't feel comfortable doing that. That's, that's all. Okay. Thank you for yeah. that disclaimer. Yeah. Okay. But uh, I guess we'll move on to 27 then. Okay. And he shall confirm the covenant case. So if you go back. You read the other one. And after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. Then you got the colon. Or uh, whatever. And then it says that stuff about the people of the prince. Blah, right. blah, 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 blah. But then it goes back and he. And it can't be the prince because the prince is not the subject of that last sentence. It's the people of the prince. If it was referring to that, it would say, and they. Yeah, but exactly. Since but since it says, and he, it must be referring back to Messiah. Just by the structure of the, the words of the sentence itself. So, and he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. I think that's pretty clear when you read that. You don't have any outside noise of poor prophecy in your ear. You can see that. That's Jesus confirming the covenant with many for one week. Right? That's Messiah. Yeah. And in the midst of the week shall he cause the sacrifice and oblation to cease. So that's when he was cut off from the land of the living. And he is sacrificed. And <clears throat> it says in the scriptures that the, uh, the veil of the temple was torn in half. So that would be the veil that... Uh, is between the uh, the most holy place and the others in the temple. And this is also possibly going outside of the Bible, but uh, the Jews would not do the sacrifice with the curtain rent in two like that. So him, him being... Uh, cut off and in the midst of the week, which makes sense because he had about a three and a half year ministry. So half of seven midst of the week, three and a half that he caused the sacrifice and oblation to cease by being sacrificed and having that curtain rent. Yeah. And then, yeah, isn't there something, uh, Boy, I just I can't remember right now. Is there something maybe you can remember? If not, we'll forget it. But how the priest would uh, he would walk in to the inner temple or whatever, and then he would make himself holy before he would go out and uh, and do his offerings for the people or something. Am I saying that right? Am I way off? Oh. Um, yeah, no, I think I think you're close there. Back when they, back when they had the uh, the tabernacle of the Lord. Tabernacle, that's the word I'm looking for. Yeah, yeah. There was something. There was yeah. The priest would when they when God's giving them his statutes and judgments and how they're supposed to do things. I believe yeah they they'd go in there, and only one guy I think was supposed to go in there to keep the. 
candle lit to minute to or light the incense. I can't remember exactly. It's getting yeah. Hard. It's no, been a long week. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, anyways, let's forget about that. So I was just wondering. I'll have to look into that because uh, it just kind of sort of came to me that uh, you're talking about the <clears throat> what was that you're talking about the being being that uh, rent the veil the veil being rent the, right the veil of the temple was rent in two so that so they wouldn't do sacrifices with that rent i don't think no right but regardless uh when jesus died that was a one-time sacrifice that put an end to the sacrifice of blood and goat of a of of uh you know goats and yes which made bulls. those sacrifices actually from henceforth from then on would have made them abominations right and would make them yeah abominations so and then the next or the continuing that sentence and for the overspreading of abominations he shall make it desolate so the way i've come to interpret it that is that it they continued doing the animal sacrifice even after jesus was the perfect sacrifice but i do not believe that is in the scripture either so i'm not exactly going to teach that but that's kind of what i've seen it as so he made the city desolate because this is all this whole <clears throat> This whole uh, prophecy is determined upon his people, right? De de determined upon thy people. Determined upon Daniel's people. Which is another thing that shows it can't be... Or yeah, it's, it's for the Jews type of thing, right? What, what is... That makes sense. The, the 70 weeks are determined upon thy people. And that's speaking about Daniel's people. Okay. So this whole prophecy has to do with the Jews kind of thing. Well, so that. Yep, go ahead. Yeah, Let's no. I, I, okay, so I agree. Yes. Yeah. But I think it's important to understand that it's it's not it's not the Jews even though it is the Jews, it's God's people. Yes. Okay. So, uh, because God is not a respecter of persons. Yeah. So, uh, so it is. So, like what you're talking about is God's people. Is I'm sorry, is the Jews. So you're right about that. But I, you know, I'm hearing now. I heard. Yeah, you know, this is the problem when you listen to too many people. I heard somebody the other day talking about. Uh, oh my goodness! Something about. Uh, so I'm not sure if he was talking about this. Uh, I think he was talking about this. Well, anyways, he was saying that this is not about Christians. This is all about the Jewish people. And then he was talking about also in Revelation 3 to Revelation 19. It was not about the church. It was all about the Jews. And so that's the only reason that I brought that up. Be, I just yeah. make it clear. This is there's not a, there are not special groups of people. Okay, so you're right talking about the Jews, but what you're really saying is God's people. Right? Yeah, yeah. Kind of what I'm saying is the. I think that kind of says that the the physical fulfillment of this prophecy is determined upon the Jewish people in that time. And the end of this prophecy, the end of the 490 years, is kind of when the word of God went out to the Gentiles as well. Right. No, right. That, that's right. Absolutely. But yeah, also putting, uh, adding to your point there, uh, Colossians 3 and 9 it says uh, like lie not one to another seeing that ye have put off the old man with his deeds and have put, put on the new man which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him 
where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond nor free, but Christ is all and in all. Yeah. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave ye, so also do ye. So it's just saying there is no Greek or Jew anymore with Jesus. Right. It's all. And then so all those references to the Jews or Israel, we are Israel now. We are the people of God. Exactly. Your yeah. point. Yeah. And, uh, you know, you, I mean, if you really wanted to get argumentative, you could say it never was, even when it was the Jews, it was never even about uh, their flesh or, or, you know, their, you know, the, whether you say it DNA or their ethnicity or you yeah, know, their hair color, it was never about any of that. It was never hereditary. It was always... Right. It was always uh, spiritual. It was those who believed. The people of the Lord. Like, yeah, like the Jews always had other people that were living with them, right? Yeah, they did. Yeah, they always had the, the stranger that lives with you or whatever. Right, when God pulled Moses and his people out of Egypt, they were not all Hebrews. Agreed. And then along the way, they picked up lots of people too. Yeah. But and yeah, and even even Jerusalem when they conquered it, they weren't able to get all the Jebusites to leave. Yeah. So there was there was the Jebusites living amongst them, anyways. Yeah. So. Yeah. So it never was about ethnicity or blood type or hair color or how big your nose was. It was never about any of that stuff. Um, but. Uh, there was a select group of uh, uh, people that represented uh, the people of God, right? And yeah. so now, yeah. uh, we that believe in Jesus Christ, we represent are the people of God, right? And uh, Amen. All the glory to Him for that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So good point on that. Yeah. 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 So Jesus, Jesus was, he caused the sacrifice to cease by becoming the perfect sacrifice. Absolutely. And so the, so this becomes desolate and he shall make it desolate. The overspreading of abominations. Is that, is that where you left off? Yeah. Yeah. Even unto the consummation. So the full consummation of the destruction of, I don't know. Maybe, maybe is that spiritually talking about the law? Uh, no. <laughs> now that's what I was kind of wanting to pick your <laughs> brain about. Okay, because you know what that word consummation means, right? Like yeah, a, completing. Yeah. But yeah, let me see if I can pull up a. A quick definition here. The action of making a marriage or relationship complete. Okay. Mm -hmm. Good point, right? Okay, so, so the consummation. So how would you apply that to, the, to this, uh, you know? I, I would say that this consummation has to apply to... Well, that you know, it definitely applies to Jesus uh, after. I mean, would you agree after his after the covenant is confirmed? So this has to be after that. Would would you agree, or am I off on that? You shall confirm. You shall confirm. Shall confirm. With many for one week, and in the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice of the oblation to cease, and for the overspreading of abomination he, he shall make it desolate, even until the consummation. And that mm -hmm. shall be 
poured upon the desolate. So this that word even until suggests that even until something in the future. Is that am I off on that? Yeah. No, no. That makes sense. I like okay. that. So then, then so the sense. question, the question would be, what is, what exactly is the consummation? Is it, uh, is it his? I don't know if you have thoughts on this. Is it his resurrection, or is, is it his coming, his return, or something else? Do you have any thoughts on it, that? Yeah, it almost because, yeah, I find uh, it's so human and easy for us to think of things in the physical sense. And I think that was something that was kind of blinding me with this, why I was kind of looking at the physical destruction of Jerusalem is because I'm flesh and I just think in the physical, but I need to get in the spiritual and realize that this is God speaking and it's a prophecy and he speaks, he's a spirit. So, so I need to understand this spiritually as well. Yeah. Right. So. So yeah, I could totally I, I see that now. For the overspread of abominations, you shall make it desolate. Even until the consummation. Yeah. So it's almost like he's making the temple desolate. The physical temple desolate until the cons consummation. For now we are the temple of God. Yeah, now see that's kind of getting deep now, right? Cuz uh oh boy, you know Okay, first of all, uh you're right there is a there's a difference between uh we could how do we do this? Uh, we got we have the old temple of God, right? And then we have our temple, our body is the temple of God. Right? And so we hear about this um uh, like you, to your point, this uh, what's going to be desolate? Is it going to be the temple? Is it going to be the city? Is it going to be the body? And so that's a great, in my opinion, mm -hmm. that's something worth uh, uh, pondering. Okay. Yeah, yeah I think I, uh, yeah, I need to do some more research into this. <laughs> yeah, okay. So, yeah, me too. And, uh, now, this consummation here, I, I just don't know. Uh, uh, the, the, the only one, the, I've not heard anybody really talk about it. Uh, I just remember the one guy, he talked about the consummation being the fall. Now, have you heard this? No. Yeah, and so I don't know what he was talking about. Uh, and to me, that just, I don't know how to explain it. When something's not right, there's like, uh, you know, like this, my head shakes. It's just like, uh, that, that that doesn't vibe right with me, right? And yeah. so uh, I don't believe this consummation is a negative, but a positive, if that makes any sense. So, uh, you know, it, it I may be think, overthinking it, but I just wonder if this uh, consummation is the... Either the resurrection of Jesus or and or his return, and you could argue that his resurrection and his return is the same uh, because he's the first fruits of the dead, and then mm -hmm. the fulfillment of that will be when he returns and we are resur uh, resurrected yeah. with him. Yeah, now, is that the consummation? Yeah, because that's when he will have all enemies put under his feet, right? Right. So, yeah. So, that could be the consummation. And that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. Yeah. So, that is the wrath of God being poured upon the desolate, the desolate being those that don't have the Spirit of God within them. Exactly. And so, that would be... Now, I don't want to get started on this, but that what would be a great discussion, in my opinion... Uh, Next time, yep. unless you have something else you want to talk about, it would be exactly no. um, the abomination of desolation.
as we read here and also as we will read in uh, Daniel 11 and 12. Right? Absolutely. Let's do it. That's a good, uh, it's a good segue. Yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> uh, yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. That's pretty cool. It's not going to show my notification because uh, you're here with me. I don't know if you saw that or not, but yeah, let's, uh, yeah. Yeah, let's uh, let's end it there, and, and uh, maybe next uh, time, whenever you feel like it, uh, we can talk about. Um, so we'd have to talk about uh, Daniel eleven and twelve, and also Matthew twenty four, Mark thirteen, and Luke twenty one, right? Because Jesus makes reference to the abomination of desolation. Okay, I'm gonna have to do some research on that one. I don't. I'm not the I'm not going to claim that I know much about that. <laughs> okay, but, so, I, but I will. But I will do some research, and uh, we'll dig into the Word of the Lord. And Lord willing, uh, He will uh, give us some insight into it. Uh, yeah. And I feel, yeah, yeah. Hey, you've been great tonight, man. Uh, you you know your stuff, and I learn a lot listening to you. I appreciate it, man. Yeah, no, I really like going on with you. Thank you for doing everything with the. Uh, pulling up the verses and doing all the reading and hosting this and posting it. I really appreciate it all. Doing all right. a good, you're doing a great thing. I learn stuff from you every time. Like you totally gave me a completely different and probably better way to look at verse 27 there. Yeah. Well, I, it's just, I, you know, I don't know. I really don't, you know, you've got this stuff pegged down so tight that it's just that one word. Like I said, it just, to me, it, it's a positive and not a negative, like I said. So, anyways, I'll let you go. To, I got to get some sleep, man. It's been yeah. good talking to you. Been good. But, yeah, it could be both, too, right? It could be uh, multiple fulfillment of prophecy. It very well could be. You betcha. Yeah. All righty, brother. You rest well. Thank you again. That was – you are great. Love yeah. talking to you. Hey, good job, man. We'll talk to you later. Cheers. Yeah.